Well, we have been dealing with the Romans chapter 12, and our whole premise is that most people only know the first two verses. Present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto God. This is your spiritual worship. Uh, be transformed in your mind, not conformed to the world. Then you'll be able to test God's perfect will and so forth. But then it goes on and it says in verse 3, For by the grace given me, I say to everyone, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with. And then it goes on and it says, with your gifts, you give according to the grace given to you. And then he goes on and names the gift. Then he goes on verse 9 and he says, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Love must be devoted to one another. Love must honor one another above yourself. Never be lacking zeal, but keep spiritual fervor serving the Lord. How? Through love. Be joyful in hope, patient affliction, faithful then. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. How do I do all this love? By practicing hospitality. So what he says is, he starts off, he says, be a living sacrifice. And the question is how? Well, be transformed in your mind. And then you'll be able to test God's perfect will. Well, then he says, how do I do that? Humble yourself. Stop being arrogant. Use your gifts for the body of Christ. Bless the body of Christ. How? By practicing hospitality. This is the end of chapter 12. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who need to rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low positions. Do not be conceited. Okay, are you ready? Let's go. The first one is bless. Oh my goodness. Bless those who persecute you. Now, let me just say this to you. Nowhere in this scripture does it say this is only spiritual. So let's translate it because the word persecute today is not really a modern day word. So people who bug you. How many people have somebody in your life and you have a person in your life or more than one who bugs you? Just raise your hand. How many are you sitting beside that person today? Okay. How many got married to that person? Okay, and for, for better or for worse. The Bible says, bless those who persecute you, bless them and do not curse them. Christians, we have the ability to bless or we have the ability to curse. Now let me share this with you. When you start to understand, trust in the Lord with all your heart, you present yourself as a living sacrifice, you realize Jesus is Lord, the Bible says, revenge is the Lord's. Let him take care of it. When somebody is persecuting you, bugging you, that they're doing things that are not biblical, do not lower yourself. Because what the world wants you to do is lower yourself and curse them. That's lowering yourself. But the Bible says bless them. How do you bless them? Love them. Love them. I mean, Jesus is our example on the cross. Before he goes to the cross, they, they do stripes on his back with whip. They put thorns in his head. They do all this stuff. And what does Jesus do? Says the soldier, hey, I forgive you. You nailed me to the cross. Hey, I forgive you, man. Hey, thief, this day you'll be with. He blesses. He doesn't curse. He could call 10,000 angels, wiped out the whole Roman army. Bless. Here's the craziest thing that it drives me nuts today. It is how Christians have the hardest time blessing. Christians have the hardest time blessing people. I mean, what do you do? It's not just with your words, but it's with your actions. Your actions speak louder than words. Can I just ask you something? When was the last time you blessed somebody who bugged you? Now, let me just share this with you. When you bless somebody who bugs you, God will bless you. Because God sees this. Now, now, here's the craziest thing. When you take that natural step of faith and you bless, God will show up and help you with the Holy Spirit. But you first have to take that first step of natural blessing, and then he'll show up and help you with the rest. Now, watch this. Are you ready? Here's the second part about blessing. You'll drive the person nuts. No, no, no lie. 
Many people have cursed me. Many people, matter of fact, in my occupation, I'm right up there on the top of the most disliked people in Canada. Evangelical Pentecostal pastor. Disliked. There's people in Ottawa dislike me. There's people in Toronto dislike me. I found out there's people who dislike me in Vancouver. I didn't even know I knew anybody in Vancouver. And here's the craziest thing. They dislike me. And guess what? It drives them nuts. Because God has taught me, you want to drive them nuts? Love them. So you bless them. You send them gifts. You do stuff for them. You, you tell them you're praying for them. Matter of fact, one guy who persecutes me quite a bit, matter of fact, he, he really persecutes me, what I do is I found out that his wife likes my preaching. So I make sure she gets all my sermons. Drives him nuts. Bless. And here's the craziest part. If you curse, you lower yourself. The second one is this, rejoice. Rejoice with those who rejoice. In other words, have a, be happy. We, we had a party at our house a long time ago before COVID, and my wife, she has this crazy, insane idea about party. You invite the whole world. And all of a sudden, this person, the sourpuss, showed up, and he was so negative, and he was so rude, and he was so, he just, it was like he had vinegar oozing out of him. And halfway through the party, she comes to me and says, take care of this guy, he, she, this guy's killing the party. So I bring him in the kitchen all by myself. I said, well, what's wrong with you? you? You're just sour. And he starts telling me, I said, okay, let's pray. And we pray. And then I said, now go out and be really lots of fun or get out of the house now. You got two choices, okay? And he went out and tried to be, he tried to be fun and, and I gave him credit for it. But here's the craziest thing. We as Christians, we need to rejoice. We need to, and, and, and you find people are rejoice. Don't bring them down, to lift them up. I tell you something, and I, I say this to you, not only rejoice with those who are rejoicing, laugh with them. Laughing is one of the best medicines in the world. I tell you something, when I'm down in the dumps, I go to the staff and they start telling me jokes that I've already heard. Ed tells me the same joke all the time, but I laugh because it's so funny because Ed doesn't have another joke. <laughs> and, and here's something, when you rejoice with somebody else, it is medicine for the soul. Then he says mourn with those who mourn. Now, let me give you two things. What he says is this, when somebody is grieving, help them grieve so they can be healed. Now, when I started in ministry, I had the hardest time mourning, and, and, and I had to be careful. There was a lady in our first service who was 99, so I had to be careful. But there was a person in our church when I first pastoring, she, she was 102 and she died. And, I, I, and everybody at the funeral was mourning. And it was like, why would they be mourning? This lady lived to be 102, give me a break. At 102, you shouldn't, and then the pastor said, no, the word mourning here is, we are sad, we will miss her. Yes, we're thankful she lived 102. Yes, we're thankful she's with the Lord, but we are hurt and aggrieved inside because we have lost such a great friend, a great pillar in the church. And then he looked at me, he says, help people who are grieving so they can be healed. Then he goes on and says, live in harmony with each other. And he's just not talking about the church. He says, live in harmony. The fact is this, they will know that we are Christians by our love. What is one of the characteristics of love? Harmony. Okay? I mean, here, here's the craziest thing. It takes two people to argue. It takes two people to argue. And, and, and you know what, I, I just don't argue. I mean, I just, when, when somebody, in, when some relative like an aunt or an uncle or a cousin wants to start to gain some arguing with me, I just sit there, I go totally docile. I mean, I'm like dead, right? Because I refuse to give that person any ammunition or fuel. 
Usually I'll say, boy, thank you so much for sharing your opinion. You want to go get ice cream? And, and, and then he goes on, he says, humility. He says, you don't be proud. How? By associating with people of lower status. And this is not just financially. This is in, in other, back then the cultures, they had certain cultures that were higher status and other ones that were lower status. And the, but the point is this, they, it, it was humility. I mean, humility. I, I had a friend out in Edmonton. Well, he became a friend of mine, but when I first went to Edmonton, I was on staff there. This guy showed up with the poorest suit and the poorest car, and I, I thought the guy never had two cents to rub together. Matter of fact, I wanted to buy him a new suit. So I go to the senior pastor, just as a naive starting pastor. I said, let me go, you know, can I go buy this guy a suit? And the pastor says, get in my car. And we're driving around Edmonton. He says, you see this block of apartment buildings here? Yeah, he owns them. You see that apartments over there? Yeah, he owns them. Here, let's go around the corner. You see all these apartments here? Yeah, he owns them. He owns four blocks. I go, what? Here's the craziest thing. Are you ready? You know why he wore a suit that wasn't a rich man's suit? You know why he drove a poor man's car? He wanted to make sure that everybody felt comfortable around him. Now, the, God never said that you don't have to drive a nice car, and God never said you have to you know, have, drive a, a poor man's suit or anything like this. But the point is this, that's what he felt in his heart he needed to do. Can I just say this to you? Living sacrifice. How, how, how do we do all this? Well, number one, go back to the beginning of Romans 12. Transform your mind. Do you, do you ever notice that when Jesus needed to transform his mind, he went away and prayed? But then he came out and he did. Now, the two of them go hand in hand. Pay attention. This is the whole sermon. Are you ready? If I need God to transform my mind, I go to prayer and I lay it down at his feet. I pour my heart out to him. Like King David, create in me a clean heart, restore a right spirit unto me, joy, the joy of thy strength. And he just pours his heart out. The Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord, he shall renew your strength. You mount out. So what Jesus does is this. He wants to transform mind. He gets alone in prayer. But then when Jesus leaves, he goes and does what the Lord wants him to do, Father God wants him to do. Now, now, just praying doesn't do it. What you do is you take prayer and then you step out in faith and do. And for some of us, we got it so backwards. What, what we say is this, well, you know what, when God touches me, then I'll do. No, God's not going to touch you until you start to try to do. And then when you start to try to do, God will touch you. Now, here's the craziest thing. A lot of us in this room, we know about the scripture, transform mind, but it, our relatives would say, he doesn't have a transform mind. Matter of fact, he has a mind that is just terrible. I mean, when was the last time your relatives looked at you and said, transform mind? He has it. See, a lot of us, we wear Christian clothes, and we look Christian, and we have so many different outfits to make ourselves look religious and, and godly. And for some of us, we have big Bibles. And for some of us, we want to make sure everybody knows we know all the songs, so we sing as loud as we can, and we wave our hands, and we do crazy things. And for some of us, we even yell amen at the inappropriate time. But God looks at the heart. And he doesn't look on the outward appearance, and it's not really what you wear. It's what you are. And when you stand before Jesus, he's not going to say, oh, you were so godly when you wore that blue jean jacket, or you were god when you wore that sports jacket, or you were so, oh, you got points for, no. It's, you were so godly when your heart 
was so in tune with me because you took prayer and you became a living sacrifice and you showed it by going and doing what I want you to do. I've learned this the hard way because I've had people who persecuted me, and I mean really persecute me. And what I've had to do is go to prayer because the real Billy wants to kill them. The real Billy wants to curse them. The real Billy wants to lower myself to the standard of them because I know I probably could win. And I go to prayer, and God, all of a sudden, he transforms my mind. And then he says, now leave the prayer room and start blessing them. And when I start blessing them, it hurts. I don't want to. But then all of a sudden, God gives me joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to enjoy it. And I overbless them. And I keep blessing them. This brings me to application number two, living sacrifice. Putting people second. Wait, did you make a mistake putting people second? No. See, putting people second because God is always first. Remember, the, the guy says to Jesus, love the Lord your God with all your soul, strength, and mind, and all this. Then love your neighbor as yourself. When, when, are, when are we going to put people second and ourselves third? And then he ends with this. He goes, then you'll know God's will. When your mind is transformed and you're living sacrifice, you'll then know God's will. And what is God's will? Love. How? Through hospitality. Have you ever noticed that the root of hospitality is hospital? <laughs> I did. I was 19 years old. I was sitting in a service in Springfield, Missouri, and a guy from New Orleans got up. His name is Marvin Gorman. His church was only 6,000 people. And he was talking about the new sanctuary they built. It sat 2,800 people, and it had everything in it that a church would want. Large auditorium, large gymnasium, large children's wing, large youth wing, huge parking. It even had little shuttle buses so people who were far away in the parking lot could get on the bus and be shuttled into the church. Incredible. He said, the night before we opened the church, he said, all of New Orleans wanted to see it, and we wouldn't let anybody in the church until the opening Sunday, and we're gonna have special services. He we said, we're gonna have over six services that Sunday in order to get all of the people in. But I was at the altar, and I asked everybody to leave the church, and this is the night before we're opening the church. And he said, he's talking about how beautiful everything, perfect. And he says, I, I'm praying at the altar, and he said, I fell asleep. I was so tired. And he said, when I'm asleep, God gave me a dream. He said, I saw a beautiful hospital, a brand new beautiful hospital. It had the best equipment in all of the United States. It had incredible doctors, nurses, everything. The floors were white marble. I mean, everything was perfect. And in the background, I heard ambulances coming. And he said, and I still remember this. He says, I heard more than one ambulance. I heard dozens of ambulances. And I saw them coming down the road as fast as they could. And the medical staff came out to stand on the the at the emergency where the, emergency, the ambulance was back up. And he said the owner of the hospital came out as people were gained out of the ambulance, broken arms and cuts and big traffic accident. The owner of the hospital said, no, no one's allowed in here. No one's allowed into my beautiful hospital. No, you'll dirty the floor. Go, go get better before you come into my hospital. And he says, I woke up and God said to me, congratulations, you built a beautiful church. Now dirty it. Don't you ever turn anybody away. Don't you ever say no, you can't come in. But bless them, 
love them. And he says, on my opening Sunday, I stood up and I said, isn't this beautiful? Good, let's use it so it doesn't look this way in a year from now. He said, let's make sure we use it for the glory of God and we let everyone in and we never turn a person away because they smell too bad or they're too poor or they're, they're let's use it for the glory of God. That's hospitality, hospital. Will you bless those who persecute you? You mourn with those who mourn. You grieve with those who grieve. You hurt with those who hurt. You hang out with people that smell. You hang out with people that you don't want to hang out with but through the love of God, you're going to hang out with them. See, it's not what you wear. It's not what you look like. It's what you are. That's what God counts. But here's the truth. What you are will show Christ through your actions. You know, a lot of us can't do Romans 12 because we have fear. We have fear of hospitality. We have fear of blessing. We have fear of mourning with people. We just, it, fear stops us. Let, let, let me give you an illustration. Majority of Christians are quiet right now. I don't know if you heard about this this week, Roe versus Wade. H anybody hear about this? Yes. Uh, if you haven't, you must be dead. See, back in 1973, the Supreme Court and the United States government, they changed everything, and they made it so that every state in the United States had to perform abortions. And some states said, no, we don't want to. It doesn't matter. You must perform abortions. And since 1973, they've been turning Roe and Wade upside down and trying to get it abolished. And this week... The Supreme Court of the United States of America threw Roe versus Wade out the door, and which means that some states can now say, like Louisiana and Mississippi, no, we will not do abortions. Now, now here, here's the craziest thing. Are you ready? There's people in Ottawa who are screaming, who grew up in a Catholic church, who are screaming, this is wrong! Everybody should have an abortion. And here there is a crazy Christian in Toronto who's yelling, that precious baby do not kill because Jeremiah chapter one says, the Lord God says to Jeremiah, I knew you before you were even in your mother's womb and I have set you apart to do the work of God. God knows you. That baby inside mommy is alive and don't kill it. And yet somebody in Ottawa is screaming, kill him, kill him, kill him, to the point that last year in Canada, 74,000 abortions. Oh, just under one million abortions in the United States of America. Now, here's the craziest thing. I never knew this. When Roe versus Wade got turned upside down, Canadian Pentecostal pastors became persecuted. Where people who found out that I'm an evangelical Pentecostal Christian would come up to me and start saying, how dare you take women's rights away in the United States of America? And I looked at them and I said, this is what I wanted to say. I never took anybody's rights away because I'm a Canadian. But then I thought, I'm preaching on Sunday about blessed are those who persecute you. And I said to them, 
bless you. Bless you in the name of Jesus. And also, let's bless every precious baby that is born. I never knew, being a Canadian Pentecostal, you get persecuted for what they do in the United States. But the Bible says it doesn't matter who you are or where you live, when somebody persecutes you, bless. Now somebody says to me, so do you, do you tell them what you believe? Yes, if they're willing to hear. If they're not willing to hear, you're wasting your time. But many times, I will let them yell at me and scream at me and they tell me to beep, 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 beep. And then later on, they'll come to me and say, so what do you believe? Because I didn't create division, but I created love by blessing. Jesus didn't come to condemn, Jesus came to save. I'm not here to win an argument. I'm here to see them come to know Christ. And some people say, oh, during COVID, you should have got locked up in jail and you should have thrown yourself under the bus and you should have been in prison and you should have stood up for blah, 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 blah. Can I just share this with you? When people are doing stuff that's coming against the church, I don't go to jail. What I do is bless them and become friends with them. And by becoming friends with the leaders, then they start to hear my side and they start to turn around and say, okay, help us get the churches through COVID. One is a worldly militant view and one is a biblical, let's bless. So how many people in your life, they bug you spiritually or, or intellectually or, or just, they just bug you? And you return it by bugging them. Why don't you be like Jesus? Bless them. Remember, it's not what you wear. It's what you are. Hospitality. Hospital. Don't be in fear. But through prayer, get your faith and then do it. <laughs>